sharing to the cloud. Good evening, everyone. This is Jerry and Barbara Seymour with Seymour and the Word, and we are so thrilled that you would take your time to join us tonight. If you turn in your Bible to Hosea chapter 6, Barbara's going to start off with some comments from last week's lesson on chapter 6, and then we will continue on into chapter 7. Let's pray. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Just take a deep breath and welcome Holy Spirit. Mm -mm. Mm. I dare you just reach out, reach out your left hand. Just reach out, reach out your left hand. And joy, just pat him on, pat him on the leg. Hallelujah. Just pat him on the leg because you're you are seated in heavenly place, places with Christ Jesus. Jesus is at the right hand of God Almighty. And we are seated next to Jesus according to the Word of God. Holy Spirit. We turn our face towards you. We let go of fear, worry, anxiety, dread, stressed out, unbelief. We look longingly into your face. Reveal Jesus. 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 Jesus, I welcome you right now. We've got to have you. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. Wow, wow, wow. It's amazing what we do, what happens when we just stop and welcome Holy Spirit in the room. It's amazing. What takes us so dadgum long just to stop? And welcome Holy Spirit in me. I repent. I repent. I choose to walk with you more consistent than ever before. Jesus. Amen. 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 We are desperately aware of our need for the love in the presence of Jesus Christ. Well, I want to share something tonight that I wish I had learned a long time ago in my walk with the Lord. You know, this, there's things that you hear when you're first saved, and then there's things that you understand and get a handle on after you get older in the Lord, and not just older in age, but I'm sharing something that I really do wish I had learned a long time ago. And when we get saved, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, no matter what age or what time in life this happens, if it's a true, really true conversion, really true headlong into this relationship with the Almighty God, we do it with our whole heart. Come on. We do it with passion. We accept Jesus with um, with passion that goes even beyond a love a lot of times of our spouse or our girlfriend or our parents, whoever, whatever, rela whatever relationships we were deep into at the time. When we accept Jesus, we love us some Jesus. I mean, we just are headlong, wholehearted, falling in love with the Lord. Come on. And that's the way it should be. Right. That is exactly how it should be. We should fall headlong in love with Jesus. We do all the right things. We read our Bibles. We pray. We journal our prayers. We go to church. We take communion. We get water baptized as our public confession of faith. We even go on missions trips. We give our money to help spread the gospel. We do so much to show our passion for Jesus and to show our love for Jesus. But the thing that I've noticed that I've learned later in life that I wish I had learned earlier in life is the element of trusting Jesus. You're about to preach. <laughs> well, that's what we're here for, right? Come on and preach. Ain't nobody leaving. 
I wish I had learned how to trust Jesus younger in life. And there's nothing wrong with what we do to show our love. But what do we do and what does he want? Because he's asking for our trust. I am of the confidence and of the conviction at this point that God knows we love him. Yeah. God knows that we love him because of our response, because of our, our actions to him, how we treat others, how we want to represent him well. Obedience. No, that's not the evidence of love obedience is the evidence that we trust him come on especially in an obedience in hard things when you're asked to do something hard and you don't know the outcome of that obedience you have to trust you have to have a level of trust in that person who's asked you come on to be to do this thing and that you're wanting to be obedient to. And I'm sure most of you, even in your marriage relationship in earlier years, you didn't trust your spouse like you trust them today. Or maybe vice versa. I don't know. I hope it grew in trust. I hope it grew in trust as you were married and as the years passed by. But this is where I see part of what Hosea 6, 6 is teaching us. Last week, Jerry taught on Hosea 6.6, 6, which is a very familiar passage. Once I say it, we may not recognize the chapter and verse, but when I read the, the passage, you will go, oh yeah, I've heard that a lot. But I, I believe after his definitions last week that he shared on the word of mercy and knowledge and burnt offerings, if I sacrifice, remember, sacrifice. yeah, sacrifices. We can see that there is an underlying trust issue that God is really looking for. Mm -hmm. So let's see what Hosea 6, 6 says. In the New King James, it reads, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Amplified reads, for I desire and delight in dutiful, Dead. steadfast love and goodness. Come on. Not. not sacrifice and the knowledge of and the acquaintance with God more than burnt offerings. So that takes it even to a deeper level than what the New King James says. I looked it up in the message, and the message. I mean, it leaves no stone unturned. I, I like the message like Jerry likes the Amplified. And the message says, I'm after love that lasts. God's not after a love that is flighty or up one day and down the next. God's not looking for love that says, you know, I... I don't like you. I love you today, but I don't like you today. That's not the, the kind of love God's looking for from his children. He wants love that lasts, no matter the circumstance. So the message says, I'm after love that lasts, not more religion. I want you to know God, not go to more prayer meetings. Boy, that puts it right there. You broke the covenant just like Adam. See, Adam didn't trust God. He didn't trust God not to eat from that fruit. He had greater curiosity than he had trust. His curiosity was a higher level of what that fruit tastes like than his trust was to be forbidden from it. Y'all tracking with me? Come on. So in this topic of trust, of love and trust, um, I found a couple other verses that states the same thing. So this is not a one-time statement in scripture. There are seven other places that almost say the exact same thing, which make, and some even in the New Testament, 
which makes it very clear that this is a issue at the heart of God. Right, right. This is not something we should just skim over and say, oh, that was just in Hosea. So we are going to look at not all of them, but I've got three I'd like to point out. Because God says many times in his word what he doesn't want are gifts and sacrifices. But when we give them out of ritual or hypocrisy, God wants us first to love, then trust him, and then obey him. Obedience comes so much better, so much easier when we trust who we're obeying than if we just love who we're obeying. We still won't know the outcome, but we'll know the one who's promised a good outcome. Amen. Amen. So let's flip over to Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40. And I'm going to pick up and read uh, verse 6. Um, verse 6 through 7 or 8. We'll see. I just want to point out this is the exact same passage that is quoted in Hebrews 10. So the writer of Hebrews used this passage to make his point in Hebrews. So Psalm 40 verse 6 says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. This is David writing about God. You're my ears you have opened, burnt offering and sin offering you did not require, didn't even require them. Then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. Hallelujah. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, and your law is within my heart. So here we have a passage that has the acknowledgement that sacrifice and offerings is not what God wants. He's looking for an ear that will be opened unto him and a willing person to do his will. Mm -hmm. An obedient, trustworthy person. Wholeheartedly trusting God with his whole heart. Isaiah 111 is another one that we're going to look at. I'd forgotten how, I mean, we, we jump into high, Isaiah sometimes and start reading it, I don't know, chapter 60 or something, 61, you know, Yeah. the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, <laughs> the first chapter of Isaiah is pretty incredible, pretty incredible. And it's especially talking in, about the wickedness of Judah, just like Hosea is. Right. Especially in reference to Hosea. Right. Chapter three through eight. So verses 11 through 17, I'm not going to read all of it, but um, it is so parallel to Hosea that we're studying. I'm going to start at 11 and then jump down to verses 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, verse 11 of Isaiah 1 says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams, the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs and goats. So there he's made the statement, multitude of your sacrifices. Jump down to 16. This is what he wants. This is what God is after. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. That sounds like something that is done in the New Testament. That sounds like Paul's writings, doesn't it? Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Okay, verse 6 is our, our definition, my biblical definition of mercy. I desire mercy. Okay, here we go. Verse 17. Verse 17. Learn to do good. Righteous. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. And plead for the widow. Justice. That 
is your actions of mercy. When you show mercy, this is what you're doing. This verse 17 is a action definition of the word mercy or love, whichever way you, you want to look at it. Um, so here, God had had enough of burnt offerings. He had had no pleasure with the blood of animals and incense is detestable. God wants us in these verses to take responsibility for cleansing ourselves you. of our evil doings, of our evil ways, and take them out of his sight. You wash yourself. That's right. You make yourself clean. You put away evil from before my eyes. You cease from doing evil. Mm -hmm. Responsibility. Are we willing to just take responsibility? Just take responsibility. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So Cindy and I were talking before class and she made the comment about um, deliverance. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I went to deliverance this past Monday, actually, for two and a half, almost three hours, washing myself. Come on. After teaching this last week, it had been scheduled, but I said, boy, how apropos that this lands on this day right after teaching the lesson from last week and acknowledging the need for washing ourselves that i end up at a deliverance session washing myself amen someone else assisting me but i took the initiative to do it right so right. it is still a good thing we're not just washing ourselves with water and soap but with the word of god and with and with renunciation of the evil things that we do and accountability. That's right. Yes, like James can, says. But we can read the word, Jerry. We can read the word and pray the word over us. But there's something happens in our spirit when we start renouncing the evil that we do. It's ugly. It's not pretty. <laughs> it's hurtful to our to our emotional side. But it is so freeing and so cleansing. Opening up and being, hold yourself accountable. Ac accountable. Be responsible for your own dadgum self. That's right. And get kick Satan out of it. Hallelujah. Come on. All of them. You're about to preach. This is better than last week, isn't it? I do believe. Okay. One more on this of the seven places in scripture that offerings and sacrifices and showing mercy is talked about. Jeremiah 7, verse 21. Jeremiah 7, 21 reads, Thus says, says the, the Lord. Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will hear, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. God wants obedience. He, he said it to their fathers when they came out of Egypt. He said it to Adam, and he's saying it to us today. He said it to the apostles. What he told the apostles read to the obey. Next, read the next verse, no, verse 24. Okay. Jer Jeremiah 7, 24. Listen to this. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsel and the dictates of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. We got a choice. Yeah. You got a choice. That's right. So it isn't the sacrifices that God is looking for. He desires our obedience and our obedience to me equals trust. And he promises that he will be our God. So that's my explanation of Hosea 6, 6. All you right. want to pick up in Hosea chapter, chapter 7. seven. All right, turn in your Amplified Bible to Hosea chapter 7, verse 1. When I would heal Israel, 
Then Ephraim's guilt was uncovered in the wickedness of Samaria, how they practice falsehood, and the thief enters and the troop of bandits vantage and raid without. But they did not consider and say to their minds and hearts that I earnestly remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings surround and entangle them. They are before my face. You see, Jewish people are, are, are famous for their elephant-like memory. They remember what is done to them and what is done for them. A, a recent president helped Israel, and he was considered by them an equal with King Cyrus. They remember, they remembered King Cyrus, and they remembered the recent events. They remember, but here they have totally forgotten. They have forgotten the wickedness, and they just want to sweep it out of the way. The problem is it doesn't sweep. It don't move. It doesn't disappear. Under the rug is not sufficient because God sees and God knows. We're no different. We would just rather just push it aside and keep going on with life, keep going on with our religious activity and, and not deal with the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. We're just like that. But the Father would say, I would love to heal you. Look at the first verse. When I would heal Israel, mm -hmm. I want to heal you. I would heal you. I would heal you. But your guilt and your wickedness and your shame your unwillingness to repent, verse 2, they did not consider or say in their minds, or nor did they remember their wickedness, and now their evil doings have surrounded and entangled them as a chain. Father is saying, I really want to, I really, really want to heal you, but I can't stand to look at you. I can't even get close to you. I can't even speak to you in first person. Mm -hmm. I speak to you in third person, them, they, there, those people. So I'm just going to talk about you in general terms. I'm not going, I, 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 I can't. God says, I, I can't. And what is our response to that? Father, I won't. I want to surrender, but surrender does not come natural to me. Mm, mm. Surrender does not come natural. Right. Fasting does not come natural to me. Giving till it hurts does not come natural to me. You see, a, a great songwriter, Rich Mullins wrote, I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want than to take what you give that I need. Mm -mm -mm. My goodness. Hold me, Jesus, because I'm shaking like a leaf. I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want than to take what you give that I desperately need. Surrender does not come natural. Verse 3, Hosea chapter 7, verse 3. You, you make the kings glad, they, excuse me, they make the kings glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lives. Look, y'all are tied up in your wickedness and your condition is from top to the bottom, from the king to the prince to the priest to the judges, to the rulers, to the people, to the peasants, to the poor, 
There is no repentance in the land. Verse four. Oh, hold up. Can I say something about one and two before we get to four? Verse four. Go ahead. Okay. You better hurry up. I will. So to me, I think that these verses, verses one and two, is a perfect word picture of how God is loving towards his people he created yet is totally holy and appalled by their sin all at the same time. Amen. Amen. The New Living Translation says, I want to heal Israel, but its sin is too great, and Samaria is full of lies. Its people don't realize that I am watching, and their sinful deeds are all around them. I see them all. Omnipotent. So when I was thinking about this particular verse, yes, the of omnipotent that word right there holy of god all knowing all seeing it it we don't think of god we don't go through our day-to-day -day life thinking that god is watching everything that i do you know i some people might i don't know i've tried to get more thoughtful about it i know he is but i don't think about it it's one of those things that, you know, I know that there's air for me to breathe, but I don't think about breathing the air. I know God is watching me, but I don't think about God watching me so much. But that's just where I'm at. But God is watching. God knows everything that I do. The weird thing about it is when I mess up, when I do something wrong, when I sin, I feel it's plastered on the billboard for everybody to read it as they go by, for everybody to see what Barbara did wrong. I feel, I just, that's the way I feel about it. I feel like it's out there for everybody. But when I do something good, minimize it. Nobody sees it. Nobody acknowledges it, which that's probably the way it's designed to happen. But let me give you some comfort. The great record keeper in the sky is keeping good records. He sees the good, the bad, and the ugly. No matter if anybody acknowledges my good, Come that's on. okay. God knows. God knows. If nobody or everybody sees my bad, it's okay. God knows that I've come back and repented and it's under the blood. The great record keeper in the sky is watching all of us and that's why we need to also watch our, wash ourselves because he is expecting us to turn to him in repentance and not just expect our good to be the only thing anybody notices. Go ahead to verse four. Verse four. They, third person, are all idolatrous, adulterous, and their passion smolders like the heat of an oven when the baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the special day of our king, the princes make themselves and the king sick with the heat of wine. The king stretches out his hand with scoffers and lawless men, for they have made ready their heart and their mind burns with iniquity like an oven while they wait while they lay in wait their anger smolders all night in the morning it blasts forth as a flaming fire they are all hot as an oven the and devour their judges all their kings are fallen there is none among them who calls on me okay so I believe that Hosea was walking past the bakery. Mm -hmm. And we see, and I don't know when's the last time you walked by a freestanding commercial bakery, but you can smell it. Yeah. You can smell it. And they got the 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 delicacies out in the window and you they just draw you in. What what draws you? Your nose. And then as you get closer, your eyes look at the 
oh my, can you just imagine what that carrot cake would taste like? Oh, oh, I, that's got to be cream cheese icing on that cake. Oh, that's a seven layer Italian cake. <laughs> What gets us there? Our senses. Yes. Our appetites. And this is what's happening. He is walking past this bakery and he says, your insatiable, intense, sexual passion for idolatry and adultery mm -hmm. burns continuously, unsatisfiable, like a fire burning hot, but not flaming until oxygen is, is introduced. And then it burst forth with all its heat and is flaming. This is exactly the way you, you rest just long enough to get your energy back, to go passionate after your lustful desires again. My, my. Mine. Well, Jerry, do you know that there's other things in scripture that are not ever quenched? Come just on. like the fire in the oven that Hosea wrote about. Look over at Proverbs 30. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 15. This whole chapter is a very good chapter to read. It is like uh, a man who has recognized that he's stupid. Surely I am more stupid than any other man, but yet he recognizes the, that God is pure. Come on. It, it's a beautiful chapter in verses uh, 11 through 14. You might as well put into the 21st century that we're living today. But Solomon but, did not write this. But Solomon did not write this. Uh, Argue wrote this. And we're going to pick up in verse 15. The leech has two daughters. Give and give. Now, if I would have been the mother, I would have said, named them give and give more. Because these four things that never give up just want more and more. There are three things that are never satisfied for never say enough. Just like the oven in Hosea, the grave, the barren womb, and the earth that is not satisfied with water and the fire that never says enough. So this again is not a one-time statement here in Hosea. This has been said again. It's been said in uh, uh, justified in scripture also. Ephraim, verse 8, mixes himself among the peoples, courting the favor of first one country and then another. Ephraim is a cake not turned. See, we're still at the bakery in those days, and we have gotten back to cooking, especially baking, on a hot stone. Mm -hmm. wood fired hot stone i don't know if you've had a, a a hot stone pizza but the bottom cooks crispy but here he says your pancake is burnt on the bottom and raw on the top mm -hmm. unturned useless useless yep cannot be shared Cannot be stacked, cannot. All it is good for <clears throat> is a frisbee. Just chunk it. It'll fly. Just it's unedible. It's total. <clears throat> it's a waste. Ephraim is a waste. He says this again a little bit later on. Ephraim is a waste. And we talked about why is he calling the large population, not Israel, but, right. but Ephraim. Ephraim. Ephraim was one of the larger cities, larger tribes in the Northern Kingdom. Also a half turned cake or cake unturned 
The New Living Translation says a half-baked cake is also lukewarm. And so what does that relate to in the New Testament? In Revelation 3.16, God talks about the church of Laodicea being lukewarm, that he'd rather spit them out of his mouth. And so a lukewarm, half-turned, unbaked cake is not what God is looking for. Okay. Uh, you go go ahead. I don't have anything on 11. You go ahead. Okay, so verse 11, we have, so the chapter four, we've had four word pictures. We're going into the fourth word picture, okay? We've had the uh, the hot oven, the unbaked cake. Now we're doing the silly, whistless, witless doves. Oh, three, I'm sorry. Three images here. Verse 11 and 12. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt. They go down to Assyria. Wherever they go, I will spread my net on them. I will bring them down like birds out of the air. I will chastise them according to what their congregation has heard. So Israel is like a whistless dove. Doves can be easily scared and flutter away from e one place to another, seeking security and protection. They're easily caught, too. Doves, okay. And easily caught. Right, Mark? Um, I could see pigeons would be easily caught, but I didn't think doves would be easily caught, but... A pigeon is really a witless duck. They're of the same family. Yep, yep, yep. And you can call pigeons to you. You can feed them. They'll eat out of your hand. But um, doves, not so much. But God promises to let down his net of judgment upon them mm -hmm. and gather them together. And he is upset at them for going to Egypt and going to Assyria like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I don't know where I'm supposed to go to church. I don't know where I'm supposed to go and get the word of God. Well, you go to God. I don't know where I'm supposed to go for my healing or where I need to go for my protection. You go to God. God is your provider. God is your protection. God is your security. Come on. You go to God for those reasons. You go to church for fellowship. You go to church to to get connected with other like-minded people to help you in times of trouble. But you go to God when you're in trouble. You go to God when you are sick, when you are needing your finances taken care of. You go to God. You don't go to Egypt and you don't go to Assyria. You take the matter before the Lord in prayer. And then the fourth one, I knew there was four. The fourth one here in chapter seven is a useless as a crooked bow. Oh, my. In verse 16. Israel always misses the mark. What yes. does it say in verse chapter seven, verse 16? You turn back, you shift or change, but not upward to the most high God. You are like a deceitful, crooked bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the insolence and the rage of their tongue. They shall be caused, they shall, this shall be caused for their derision and scoffing in the land of Egypt. Egypt. The word said in uh, the message, it says you turn here and you turn there like a weather vane just going in all kinds of different directions. A useless crooked bow is dangerous for the person using the bow. The archer will get hurt by this bow because it is useless. It's dangerous for both the person using the bow and the arrow will not hit the mark that it is being pointed to. Even a skilled archer cannot work a, a deceitful, crooked bow. It is, is, like you said, 
and Ephraim here is not only a danger to yourself, but you're in, you're endangering the people around you. Mm -hmm. That is it. There, there's carrying down the people that you're associated with. Yes. Yes. So the crooked bow, the bow was warped and here God is saying the people are warped in their sin. They're warped just like the bow is warped. We will never reach our true potential in life because sin keeps us from hitting the mark, from hitting the heart of God. When that happens, our Christian testimony in Jesus Christ becomes something that is laughed at by unbelievers. The end of verse 16 in chapter 7 in the New Living or in the New King James Version, it says, and this shall be a derision in their land. I'm sorry, for the cursing of their tongue. And this should be a derision in the land of Egypt. All the people in Egypt, the people that hear about Israel, mm -hmm. will they will laugh at Israel. Mm -hmm. It will be they will be laughed at because of their warpness, their warpness, the thing for cursing of their tongue. They are like a treacherous boat. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the cursing of their tongue, and this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Father is asking, will you repent? Will you own up? Will you be responsible? Will you claim and, and be accountable? Will you be healed? I want to heal you. I want to heal you. James says, if anyone that is sick and among you, let him come to the elders of the church and be forgiven of his sins. Another place it says, when you bring your offering, when you come to pray and give your offerings, forgive, repent, go back, make things right. Father is asking us daily, continually, recognize your offenses against me recognize where you push me away recognize be sensitive to the holy spirit know when the dove has lifted yes you see we look at this the king of the old testament god's king david and we say and 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 it says in multiple places in our Bible, it says it in Samuel 13, 14, and in Acts 13, 22, a man after God's own heart. My, my, a man after God's own heart. What made him a man after God's own heart? Was he sinless? No. Was he faultless? No. Were his hands clean of blood? No. What made David a man after God's own heart? I, I was looking at the incident with Bathsheba Fox in uh, 2 Samuel. It's described in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. When the kings were at war, in the spring, David stayed at home. Wrong. Should have been, been going to war with his men. He stayed at home. He was walking around it late at night, looking over uh, the city. And he saw a woman bathing. And without good sense, he kept looking and kept looking. He should have turned away. Was he a man after God's own heart or no? But he paid. He paid. The penalty of his sin was immense. He had relationship. He had uh, Bathsheba's husband murdered Uriah. But it cost him. It cost him the life of his son. His innocent son died. Bathsheba's child. It cost him his family. 
It cost him the betrayal of, of his son. Absalom developed a, a revolt and a coup to take his kingdom away. But David repented. David repented. Psalm 51 says, I'm sorry. I messed up. Cleanse me, oh God. I have sinned. Say that. I have sinned and I repent. I'm sorry. And that's what David said. Read Psalm 51. I mean, he lays it on the line. Wash me, oh God. Wash me, oh God. You're the only one. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Oh, it gets worse. The man after God's own heart. He's king and he decides that he's going to take a census of the warriors of mm -hmm. Israel. That don't seem like a bad thing. I mean, we, we no, we're not. We're exactly on top. He counted the men of Israel. First Chronicles chapter 21, second Samuel chapter 24. And he numbered the men and Three days later, the consequences of the sin, 70,000 men died in one day. Mm. One day. David repented. David went before the Lord, said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have sinned. I repent. And guess what? God relented and held back the plague. He stopped the plague. He did not destroy the men of Jerusalem. He started at Dan and came down from the north and just, just wiping men out, the death angel. He repented. That's what God's asking for, folks. That's all he, that's what he's asking for. Pull up my notes. Before you read your prayer, I want to read because this this is how I want I had concluded my notes and I and it goes right along with what you spoke about, David. It's for us today in John first John chapter one. We have to wash ourselves as we talked about earlier. First John chapter one, verse five. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness yeah. at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Unlike David, who did not have the blood of Jesus, we have the blood of Jesus that covers us, but we still have to wash ourselves. We still have to acknowledge what we have sinned and that we have sinned. We have to continue to apply that blood of Jesus on our life when we commit a sin. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Go ahead. No, that's your prayer. You go. So, Father, we thank you. Lord, you, have, you bring us to a point. We recognize that we need you. We recognize that we push you away. We recognize that we offend, quench, and push you away. Father, we thank you, Lord, for helping us to be sensitive to the movement of the Holy Spirit. So, Holy Father, I come before you right now, and I recognize that I only come by your gracious mercy. Yes. Your own precious blood has made the way for me. Thank you, Jesus. I 
own up to my guilt and the burden of sin. I recognize I did this. I surrender my debt in exchange for your redemption. Holy Spirit, God Almighty, help me to recognize and utterly despise my sin. Yes, God. To own up to my tolerance of sin. And with all transparency, yield to the transformation you have planned for me. Mm -hmm. Surrender is not natural to me. This whole willing surrender to the process of death is not natural to me. I know there's more of you than I have knowledge of. And in your presence and long suffering toward me, in your patience and long suffering toward me, show me again those things that really turn you off. Mm -hmm. Those habitual attitudes and actions that regularly push you away. Please, please, Holy Spirit, show me again. I repent and I'm sorry. Father, I'm so tired of the well-worn trail of repentance that leads me back into your presence. I just want to learn the fine art of immediate repentance. I want to learn the fine art of immediate repentance so we never break fellowship. I see your promise of abiding under the shadow of your presence that enables me access to your secret place but i'm not there yet thank you for helping me to learn to stay positioned right next to you and in my face turn towards you i ask you that you will please pull me arrest me convict me incarcerate and correct me of my un my willingful nature to fulfill my own desires. Hold me close. Yes. Never let me wander away, Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus. I love you, and I thank you for your sweet presence. I thank you for your presence I feel right now. There's nothing more valuable in my life than your presence. Dear Father, help me to live up to my words. Help me to live up to my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our class tonight. If you'd like more information on how to accept Jesus as your Savior, just pray that prayer. Reach out to us on YouTube or on Facebook. We'd be glad to talk to you about your life in Christ and how to live that life. Until next week, blessings to you, and thank you again for joining us and for watching. Amen. Amen.